Welcome. I'm Olivia Mattis, and I'm so glad you've joined us today for a program on a really, really important story that only came to light rather recently. And we have really three of the world's experts on this particular astounding story. It's a story of Switzerland, and it's a story of Poland. It takes place in Switzerland, but the people involved were from Poland. They were Polish diplomats, they were Polish Jews, all living in Switzerland, and they concocted an unbelievable scheme. We have three speakers for you today. We have our resident historian, our expert, Dr. Mordecai Paldiel, who was at Yad Vashem for all those years, 24 years. He's on our board of directors, and he's my cherished colleague, and he's on so many of these programs. We have Heidi Fishman, who, although her family was not Polish, they were saved through this scheme that was intended for Polish Jews. So she will tell you her personal story. And then we have Alexandra Reiter, who is the grand, granddaughter of one of the heroes, really true heroes of this unbelievable, audacious story. So uh, we're going to go in that order, and then there'll be a chance later in the hour for some Q&A. I myself will be moderating your questions. You will all remain muted. We do not recognize raised hands, so we ask you to please type your questions into the chat box. I will be collecting those as they come in, and I promise that we'll get to as many as possible. And then shortly before the end of the hour, all three of our illustrious speakers will have a chance for some final thoughts. So first up is Dr. Mordechai Paldiel. So Mordechai, the floor is yours. Thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, so I want to start by uh, uh, saying that this is one of the most extraordinary stories that I came across in my many, many years of work, uh, both at Yad Vashem and outside Yad Vashem on rescuers and rescuers from Poland. So we have a combined group of Polish diplomats uh, and Jewish rescue activists. Uh, we have a Jewish person from, from different factions and different uh, ideological backgrounds, religious, non-religious, and they worked together in one of the most fascinating rescue operations which impacted thousands of Jewish lives. When I say impacted, I mean saved them. So as Olivia said, the story takes place in Switzerland, in Bern, the capital of Switzerland, where the Polish embassy uh, was located. And, uh, but uh, it's uh, the people that were affected by that were Jewish people living in far and distant places all over Europe in German and countries that were held occupied or dominated by the Germans. I just want to point out uh, briefly, a uh, number one picture on the top left is the uh, Polish ambassador in Switzerland, Alexander Ladosh. Number two is a Jewish person, Julius Kuhl, who worked in the Polish embassy. Uh, he himself came from Poland and he was in Switzerland and he, he was responsible for Jewish affairs. And then number three, is a man by the Konstantin Rokitsky in the Polish embassy. And then number four is Stefan Rinievich. And uh, that person uh, is also, I've got a, something personal uh, that he did to me and my family. He helped us, and I'll get to that in a, in a minute. Number five is uh, Avraham Zilberschein, who headed the vast rescue operation on behalf of the World Jewish Congress. Number six is uh, Yitzhak and Recha Sternbuch. And number seven is Rabbi Chaim Eis of Agudat Yisrael. All of these work together in a vast scheme known as the passport scheme. And uh, I'll tell more about that, but I want to get to my personal story first. And so this is, uh, well, you see me on the top right-hand corner. I was then six years old when we crossed into Switzerland in 1943. Uh, on the top left is my father, next to him my mother, next to her my sister Annie, who was one year older than me, and on the second uh, row 
uh, on the left is my sister Leah, uh, my sister Frida, and uh, little chubby guy is my brother Simon. And then uh, next to uh, him is uh, my little sister Mania. All of us crossed into Switzerland illegally. The Swiss allowed us to stay, but we were confined into three separate uh, places. Uh, me and my elder sister Annie, that's me there and to the left, my sister Annie, we were in a children's home, which was operated by the Jewish community. My mother and the other siblings of mine were in uh, a home for women refugees. And my father was in a home for uh, men refugees in three separate places. That was the policy of the Swiss government at the time. In other words, they allowed us to stay, but in separate places. Uh, we were refugees. We were illegal refugees. And that was sort of a penalty uh, for having crossed into Switzerland uh, illegally and also for to keep uh, watch and control over ourselves and the other refugees who passed into Switzerland. Next slide. But then I discovered something uh, which I didn't know before, and that in the Polish uh, embassy, uh, one of the principal diplomats there who worked under the ambassador, and that is Stefan Rinievich, writes a letter in 1944 to the Swiss police. And uh, in this letter, he states, will you please free the family, my family, at that time we went under the name of uh, Weisfeld. Here you see on top left, uh, Weisfeld Schlama, that's my father, Shlomo Schlama in Polish, because uh, we, we had Polish passports. Uh, will you please free them and allow them to be together? And we, at the Polish embassy, we will take care, we will, we will pay for their upkeep. In other words, they're not going to become a public charge of the Swiss government. As you can see in the paragraph, uh, move up a little bit, uh, Michael. Uh, it says uh, quickly, uh, this is written in German. Wir gestatten uns heute diese Gesuch zu unterstützen, unterstützen. In other words, we will support them. So please allow them to be united as a family. What is the Swiss response? Next uh, shot, next uh, slide. The Swiss response is, you see, the 5th of August, 1944, uh, we will allow all of the Weitzfeld family to be uh, freed and together, except for the head of the family, uh, Schlammer Weitzfeld. And this letter is written in French for some reason. And as for Schlammer Weitzfeld, being that he is in excellent health, excellent santé in French, uh, there's no justification for letting him go. He can still perform some labor in where he is. Uh, so uh, this held us. So we, that is me and my mother and my brothers and sisters, were allowed to be in Geneva, uh, but not my father. And then comes uh, the third letter. Next slide. And finally, on the 4th September 44, uh, the Swiss changed their policy and allowed my father to be uh, released and to be united with us. And as you can see uh, on the sentence which says, moyen d'existence, uh, assuré par le consulat de Pologne. Assuré par le consulat de Pologne. In other words, the Polish consulate of the embassy, they called it consulate, uh, will take care of our upkeep in, Gene in Geneva. So, we spent the last year of the war in Geneva. Then we went back to Belgium. So uh, this was done through the intervention of Stefan Rinievich. And uh, I'm so happy to be on this uh, program today to be able to thank him. But I'll say a few more words about Rinievich later on. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so what are we talking about? Uh, we're talking that under the leadership of the Polish ambassador, Alexander Ladosz, that's number one on the photo, the Polish legation in Bern initiated a vast, a vast rescue operation in close cooperation with several Jewish rescue activists, mainly in the form of providing false 
passports of Latin American countries, mainly of Paraguay, to thousands of Jews who were Polish citizens and lived in countries under German rule. In other words, converting them from Polish nationals to those of Latin American countries in order to save them from extermination. Uh, there is no precise statistics how many Jews benefited from the passport scheme of the Latin American countries and foremost of uh, Paraguay. But according to recent estimates, their numbers reaches to many thousands. In fact, 3,262 names have been certified, of, of whom 796 survived and have already been verified. However, if one takes into account the family members that also included in many of the passports, the total number of passports beneficiaries likely to climb higher, up to 8,000, of which between three to 3,500 may have survived. Now, the calculation was that these people will, will be separated from the other Jewish people sent to uh, extermination camp and will be exchanged for German nationals living in Latin American countries. Uh, the Germans were very much interesting uh, to beef up uh, the German army with soldiers because their war was not going so well for Germany. And so they needed many German nationals. So if these Jews could be uh, freed to these Latin American countries who were not yet at war with Germany, and that was the calculation. <coughs> in addition, the story, Alexander Ladosh, the ambassador, allowed Jewish rescue activists to transmit important and urgent but secret messages to their Jewish colleagues in the United States on the condition of Jews in German-occupied regions via the secret transmitter in the Polish legation. In order to prod Jewish organizations in America to undertake various rescue initiatives. So, such as the frightening news sent by Sternbuch via the Polish transmitter on September 3, 1942, to Jakob Rosenheim, president of Agudat Israel. And this is what the message read. According to recently received authentic information, the German authorities have evacuated the last ghetto in Warsaw, virtually murdering about 100,000 Jews. Mass murders continue. Do whatever you can to cause an American reaction to hold these persecutions. Do whatever you can to produce such a reaction. Stirring up the statesmen, the press, and the community, inform Stephen Wise, Eliezer Silva, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Albert Einstein, Jacob Klotzkin, Nachum Goldman, Thomas Mann, and others about this. This was the first credible document that specifically informed on the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto. Now, the Swiss, when they discovered that, they were very unhappy because Swiss practiced a policy of neutrality. And the neutrality meant you can't say anything bad about the both sides in the war, uh, the Allies and the Germans. So uh, the Swiss, uh, the Polish ambassador was called in by the foreign minister of Switzerland to give an account when the Swiss discovered that. And uh, Alexander Lathers defended himself. Uh, this was a confrontation which went uh, accompanied with shouting. Uh, and the Swiss foreign minister said, we found that members of the embassy and consular staff had conducted activity that was beyond the scope of their competence and duties. Ladosh responded angrily. My government will not be able to accept your decision. My government will never understand that we now treat with absolute severity actions that are meant to save the lives of a certain number of good people. And uh, Ladosh asked the foreign minister to allow these passports to continue. The foreign minister said, I'm trying to get more information than I'll see. So it is well to note that Ladosh did not assure the foreign minister of Switzerland that they will stop issuing these false Paraguayan and other passports. And uh, this went on. So. The persons of the Polish diplomatic staff involved in this vast passport scheme operation included the ambassador Alexander Ladosz, uh, his principal aide, Stefan Rinievich, and I'm so, so glad that we have his granddaughter with us, and Konstanty Rokitsky, 
Okay, that's number one, number two, and number three. So far, only Rukitsky has been awarded a righteous title by Yad Vashem. One must also take in consideration the role of Yuri Kuld, and that is uh, number two on the photo, the Jewish staffer in the Polish embassy. Also of importance are the Jewish rescue activists who without them, the Polish diplomats would not have been able alone to undertake this vast operation. And uh, they are Avraham Zilberschein, no, that's number five, Rabbi Chaim Eis, that's number seven, and the Kapel Yitzhak and Recha Sternbuch. They all deserve to be acknowledged and praised for helping save thousands of Jewish lives. And now I want to turn over the floor to a person that uh, her own family, her grandparents were saved thanks to this uh, scheme, this passport scheme. And this is Heidi Fishman, who is uh, here with us. And uh, Heidi, uh, the floor is yours. Take it. Thank you, Mordecai. Okay, so. Uh, so we'll start with the slides. All right, so let me introduce the family to you. This is my grandparents' wedding, Heinz and Margaret Lichtenstern. They were married in Vickrath, Germany, which is near Dusseldorf, 1932. This is before Hitler came to power. They uh, consider themselves German Jews. They were not particularly observant. They were German before they were Jewish. My mother uh, was born in 1935, but at that point, Hitler was already uh, creating chaos in the world. And in 1936, the family moved to Amsterdam. So next slide, we can see my mom as a young child with her brother, Robbie, who was born in 1938. Things were fine. You know, why else would they have a second child? But then in 1940, the Netherlands was invaded. It was not a far enough place to go. And by 1942, we can see this picture on the right. This is my mother's first grade class picture. And at that point, uh, Jewish children were no longer allowed to go to public school. This is a Jewish school. You can see all the children wearing the Star of David on their um, left chest there. Um, and the one teacher. Uh, this is, you know, you can't go to public school anymore. It's not allowed. So when I was a child and I asked my mother, uh, how did you survive? We can go to the next slide. Um, the story was always, well, we had a Paraguayan passport. And I always just thought, okay, this, this explains it. When I was a child, we have a Paraguayan passport was a good enough answer for me. But when I was an adult and then I decided to write a book about uh, what my mother went through and I was doing research and I asked more questions, that was not a good enough answer. I needed to understand more. So let me show the passport, the next page. So this is, this is their passport. You see it's issued out of Paraguay. Well, it's a pub, Republic of Paraguay, issued out of Bern, Switzerland. And the names on it are Margaret and Heinz Lichtenstern and their two children. And it is, uh, the date on it is December, 1942. So what we have is a one passport for four people. And the fact that it says December, 1942 is actually, um, that date doesn't really mean much. It could have been post dated um, and it could have happened any time. It could have been created any time after that date of 30 December 1942. And then there it is signed at the bottom by Rudolf Hoogley, who was the honorary consul who was willing to take all those bribes to create these passports. The next picture shows the notarization. This is a letter of notarization I found in my grandmother's uh, papers that says the copy of the passport which is what I have is not the original, it's a copy, is a true copy. And it is, um, it comes out of Basel, Switzerland and signed by Dr. Ignaz Hersfeld. 
This is dated 19 November 1943. And I believe that is a closer true date to when all of these papers uh, were created. And as a matter of fact, I'm sorry, if we go back one slide to the passport and look in the upper right hand corner, the very, very top, the number there is number 543-43, which means it was the 543rd passport that the Polish diplomats had created in 1943. They, they kept a record of their numbers. All right, so how did this all work? The family had stayed out of the camps for a very, very long time. However, they ended up having to go to Westerbork in late 1943. And then if we look at the next slide, we can see that they were transported to Trezenstadt on the 4th of September, 1944. This is one page of many, there were over 2000 people on this transport and the Lichtenstern family is there, number 412 through 415, Heinz, Margaret, Robert, and Ruth. And they were sent to Trezenstadt. Three weeks later, we we'll look at the next slide, there is a notice comes out and it says that there will be a transport taking 2,500 men ages 16 to 55. There will be no exceptions and they will be taken to build a work camp in the Reich. Now, actually, this was one of the first few of a series of 11 transports that took 18,000 people to Auschwitz and a vast majority were gassed on arrival. My grandfather was due to be on this, um, to be on this transport. And what happened was, this is one of my mother's very clear memories that he came to her, threw himself down on her bunk in the barracks and came and said goodbye. He was crying and he basically said, be a good girl, take care of your brother, help your mother. Um, I will never see you again. And it was a horrible, tearful, awful goodbye. And then the next day he reported for that transport. When he did, one of his acquaintances basically said, don't you have a Paraguayan passport? And he said, yeah, but it's not worth the paper it's printed on. It didn't stop me from going to Westerbork. It didn't stop me from being sent here. Why will it work stopping me for the next train ride? And the guy said, don't be a fool, show it to somebody. And my grandfather did. And he was, um, very, very surprised. He was given this little tiny piece of paper, which I found in my grandmother's possession in her papers. This says Ausgeschieden, which means withdrawn. And then it's his camp number, his name, and then his birth date, and the rest is ripped off. He did not go to Auschwitz. He was withdrawn from that transport. The series of transports basically first took the men, then the wives, then the children, then the parents. It just kept it. It was a way for the Nazis to try to get people to go to Auschwitz willingly. They thought they were going to be they, they were trying to tell people families would be re, reunited. Um, and the whole family stayed in Trezenstadt, except for my mother's maternal grandparents who were on the last transport to Auschwitz where they were gassed. Now, if we look at the next slide, we can see that there were only 2,498 or 99 people on that transport that was supposed to have 2,500. I believe the missing person was my grandfather. One person, one spot was not filled. Um, which just gives me chills every time I, I look at the, the data here. So if that wasn't enough of a saving, a story of how these passports work, I want to tell two more stories. The next slide is a picture of the registration cards that the family had after the war when they were in a DP um, camp in, DP means displaced persons, in Sittard in the Southern Holland. The Dutch had a very low quota for how many um, refugees they were letting back in the country. They were, it was only seven or 8,000 people. 
even though there was over 100,000 Jews that had been murdered, 100,000 from the Netherlands. These cards all have the word stateless crossed off and substituted with Paraguay. And what I believe is that the Dutch were more willing to let in Paraguayan citizens than stateless refugees. Because of course, if you had a country to go to, maybe you wouldn't stick around and be a burden on the state. You would just, it was a stopping, a stopping way on the way to where you would go home, even though this family really thought of Amsterdam as the home they wanted to be at. My grandfather was able to travel on the passport for two years. He used that Paraguayan passport in order to uh, make a living. He was an international businessman and this was the way he traveled, uh, pretending he was Paraguayan and he was able to earn money to support his family. And these are just pictures of the family. We've got my mom and my grandparents in the upper left, my mother and Robbie at bottom, bottom left. Uh, up at the top right is um, my grandparents and I, bottom right, my mother and her mother during at her wedding. And in the middle, it's just a big group photo with many of us that's mid eighties. Um, and this family wouldn't have been, wouldn't have existed without Stefan Renievich and his buddies that uh, did the scheme. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to my friend, Alexandra Ryder, granddaughter of Stefan Renievich. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much, Heidi. My name is Alexandra Ryder. I am the daughter of Stefan Renievich, and I'm an associate professor of communication at Georgia Highlands College. And I'm really honored to be here and excited to share my grandfather's story and how I found out about this. So let's start with the first slide. This is a photograph of, of my grandfather and I taken in Buenos Aires, Argentina. It was about 1972. It is the only photograph I have of us. There may be some others that exist, but I didn't get to spend too much time with my grandfather. After he left Europe, he moved to South America as many Europeans did post-World War II. And that's all I knew about my grandfather actually is I knew he was a Polish diplomat. And I knew that after the war, he moved my family to Argentina. And that's that was my extent of my knowledge until 2018 when I received a very interesting email that we're about to show you. So actually it was 2017 when the email came in. Now this email came to my college email at Georgia Highlands College and we are strictly for, you know, urged not to open foreign email or to be very wary of the type of email we receive. And this one obviously came from overseas and I almost deleted it until I read the subject line. And as you can see, it says, looking for Stefan Jan Rinievich. And so I read the email. I thought, wow, this is my grandfather. What's going on here? So I, I read the email and it was from a Mr. Yenze Yushinsky. And he was the first secretary of the embassy of the Republic of Poland in Bern. And so he was doing some research and in this email, it was just unbelievable when I was reading this, he was listing true information about my grandfather, about my grandmother, as well as my father, Tomas, and my uncle, Jan. And he, he, everything he listed was true and accurate. And then he proceeded to list the date that my parents were married and also the year that my father passed away, which was 1983. Um, as you can see, when my father became an American citizen, he dropped the letters after the R-Y-N uh, in Rinievich, and he, we then became Van Ryn. So I was known as a child as Alexandra Van Ryn. So all of this was correct, and my heart just was pounding out of my chest thinking, oh my goodness, this is, this is crazy. I need to get in touch with this gentleman. So that's how the story began for me, is getting this email, and it was quite outrageous because when I contacted my family in Argentina, they knew nothing about this. This was entirely a secret. So next slide. 
So working at Georgia Highlands College, I have a very strong relationship with the local community. And there was a newspaper called the Daily Tribune News. It's published in Cartersville, Georgia. And they published a front page news article regarding my grandfather and his story. And I was quite honored that this was done. And as you can see in this picture, I'm actually holding a passport, but it's not one of the Paraguayan passports. It's actually my father's passport. So I, I'm holding that in the picture. And then the photographs beneath me are my father, Tomas, and his brother, Jan, uh, on the left as younger children and on the right as older men. So that's part of the article there. And then shortly after that article was published, I received an email to my college email again from Heidi Fishman. And this was early January, 2019. And she saw the article published in the Daily Tribune News. And as you can see here, it says, I saw the article about you and your grandfather in the Daily Tribune. My grandfather was saved by one of those passports. I live in Vermont, but I'll be in the Birmingham, Alabama area early in April to speak to a school about the Holocaust. And I've written a book about my family's experiences. And she inquired about whether we could present together. And since I'm a college professor, I do a lot of presentations. And I thought, I'm going to invite Heidi to present with me at my college. So that's exactly what I did. And in April of 2019, so only three months later, we did a presentation in Cartersville, Georgia, Heidi and I, where we both shared our story and our amazing link through our grandparents. And it was really just I can't even find the words to describe how amazing this was just to think that my grandfather saved her grandfather. And if that wouldn't have happened, she wouldn't have been here. So when you think about it from that perspective, it's really quite mind blowing that, that this was real, this, this saved people and not just people, a lot of people. And so it's just beyond description, the pride that I have for my grandfather and all the men of the waters group. I think it's, it's just really courageous what they did. Next slide. This really was one of the defining moments of my life. So because of the work of Mr. Jakob Kumach, who was the former ambassador, the Polish ambassador to Bern, and Mr. Yuzhinsky, who worked with Mr. Kumak, who did all the research that found the passports and the scheme and, and uncovered it all, they, in conjunction with Dr. Wojciech Kozlowski, who's the director of the Poletsky Institute in Warsaw, Poland, they were able to convince Mr. Andrzej Duda, the president of Poland, to award medals to people that were involved with saving Jews during World War II. So if you can go back to the first slide, they, the virtue, the slide before that, sorry, that was the program for the Virtus et Fraternitas, which is the name of the medal. The left picture was the copy or the, the front of the program. And then the right was, is a picture of my grandfather, Stefan Renievich. Several individuals were honored, but that was just his profile. And then of course there was Polish words as well, but I just took the photograph. The next slide is actually the medal itself, as well as the certificate of authenticity. It's all written in Poland and Polish, but you can see that it was given to my grandfather and signed by the president of Poland. This is now proudly displayed in my home in a shadow box with other, with other items from that trip. It was really quite amazing. They flew not only myself and my husband, Brady, and our four children, they also flew my mother, Patricia Van Ren, as well. So they flew us all to Warsaw to be there to accept this medal on behalf of my grandfather. And I was the one who accepted it. The next slide actually shows me in Warsaw. It was really, like I said, before you play this video, one of the most incredible moments of my life. I felt like I was at the Emmys or the Oscars. It was really quite elegant. Everything was in Polish. I don't understand Polish. All I knew is that I was lined up in the order that I was supposed to walk to receive the medal. And as I was waiting for them to call my name, 
the only two things I was thinking in my head were don't trip and don't cry. Don't trip and don't cry as you walk across the stage to shake the president of Poland's hand. So I'm going to have the video played for you now. Stefan Rydiewicz, członek grupy berlejskiej prowadzącej szeroką działalność ratowania Żydów na terenie uchwalonej przez Niemców Polski podczas II wojny światowej. Od znaczenia odbiera wnuczka pani Aleksandra Zofia Rejka. It was really quite amazing. He, the president of Poland, kissed my hand. And as I told him, it was my honor to receive this. He said it was his honor to give it to me uh, on behalf of what my grandfather did. If you can go back to the previous slide, please. Next on the left is the, of the latest article that the Daily Tribune News wrote about my grandfather. And this was me going to Poland to accept the medal and uh, details that story. So. I was very pleased and very grateful for the coverage that this story has received. And I think it's very important that this, this story, that the Paraguayan passport and the, the Waters Group, the entire story needs to be shared with as many people as possible. So very grateful for that. Uh, we can go to the next slide now. So this photograph on the right, is actually Mr. Sebastian Wadosh, who is the great grandnephew of Alexander Wadosh. So Alexander Wadosh did not have any children or grandchildren. So this is his great grandnephew. And it was such an honor to go to Poland because not only to receive the medal, but to meet the descendants of the other Wadosh group members and people that were saved directly by their efforts. So they're, just very hard to describe all the emotions that were going through my head that, that trip to Poland. We also visited Auschwitz, which was just, I don't even have words to describe that. So if you've never been, it's something that everyone in their lifetime must see. And I was really grateful to be able to take my, my family and specifically my children to see that. On the left, of the slide of the photograph of Sebastian and I is a book that Sebastian wrote. It's called When God Looks Away and it's written in Poland, excuse me, it's written in Polish, but it is a story about his great grand uncle and his, his work. And Mr. Wadosh is an esteemed uh, attorney in Warsaw, Poland. So I included him in, in this story because he's a very, very important man who's done a lot of important work for our cause. I think that's the last slide. So that's all I have. I, I thank you for your time and allowing me to share my portion of the story. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm going to hand this back over to Olivia. Wow, what exceptional presentations and people are making that very point in the chat box. I do encourage you to continue putting your questions in there. There are already some really great questions that we'll get to in a moment. Right now, I'm gonna give you time to put in more questions as I tell you about the weeks to come at the Sousa Mendez Foundation. So we have uh, several wonderful programs coming up. Next week, we focus on the cross-pollination between the African-American community and the Jewish community. We've had many such programs. This one is very unusual. It's a story that takes place in the 1920s and 30s. And it's about a small group of cantors who were African-American. They were Hebrew and Yiddish singers. And in particular, there's one who was named Thomas LaRue Jones, who was like the Caruso of the cantors and he would drive his audiences to tears. And his, he was known as Tevye the Black Cantor. So we have the world's expert on this story, who is Henry Sapoznik, the expert on all things Yiddish. And we also have Rabbi Capers Finney from Chicago, who will tell us the history of the black Jewish presence in America. So that's a very fascinating topic. And uh, Henry has been looking for a recording of Thomas LaRue Jones for 45 years. He has found one and you will get to hear it. That is a free program, just like today's program. And uh, we want a lot of people to come, so please tell everybody. 
The following week, it's the birthday of Dr. Ruth Westheimer. And we have her with us in person. She's going to be interviewed by Judd Newborn, who is a Holocaust historian, and he's interviewed her several times. They know each other well. Um, Dr. Ruth Westheimer was just like Dr. Paldiel, she was also rescued in Switzerland. She was also in some sort of an orphanage in Switzerland, a children's home. And so she's going to tell you about her story. Um, we, there also will be an opportunity to see a movie about her life. Um, so you will get all of those details. Uh, there are tickets for that program. Uh, those will be for sale on Eventbrite. The tickets are tax deductible and they're $18. And in addition, we are offering autographed copies of a children's book that she wrote. It's called Wall Roller Coaster Grandma, and it's just delightful. Um, as you can see, these are some of the inside pages. It's perfect for ages, I don't know, 6 to 12. It's perfectly G-rated. It's a very, very lovely book. And as I mentioned, it will be autographed. So I urge you to order your own copy. It's quite a unique opportunity. Following that, we are going to have a program on uh, June 12th, and that will be Doreen Carvajal and Jeannie Milgram. And that's a pro program for anyone interested in Jewish genealogy. These are two women raised Catholic who have traced their family history to their Jewish ancestors in pre-Inquisition Spain and Portugal. It's virtuosic genealogical research, and it's just, um, they have breathtaking stories to tell, so I do hope you will come to that. That is a, also a free program. And then our final program, before we take a little bit of a hiatus for the summer, will be on June 19th, Father's Day, and that's going to look at the family, the illustrious Jewish dynasty, the Morgenthau family, Henry Morgenthau Sr., Henry Morgenthau Jr., and his son, Robert Morgenthau, who was the district attorney of New York. And Dr. Paldiel will be moderating that program. We have Raphael Medoff, who is an expert on the FDR administration and its non-response, I guess, to the Holocaust and the, the role of Morgenthau, the positive role of Morgenthau, Henry Morgenthau Jr. We have a member of the Morgenthau family talking about Henry Morgenthau Sr., who was one of the first people, maybe the first person to bring attention to the Armenian genocide. So that will be another very important program and I hope you will sign up. So you'll have more information in an email after today's program. And now let's get to your questions. So question number one is, how many of the Paraguayan passport recipients actually ended up in Paraguay? The answer, the answer is none, not one. And the, the reason for that is uh, the passports, the original passports were kept in Switzerland. And the recipients of the passport received only copies of that. And why is that? Because the whole idea was that not to embarrass Paraguay, or Honduras, or Costa Rica, not to embarrass them uh, with people suddenly appearing at their doorstep. The whole intention was to allow these people to survive by getting out of uh, Nazi-occupied Europe, uh, but not to go to Paraguay. It was like a, an exit visa, an exit passport. And so the originals remained in Switzerland and uh, we are still searching for them. We don't know what happened to the original uh, passport. Uh, the assumption is that they were destroyed at the end of the war. Uh, this is similar to another story that happened where, involving the Japanese ambassador in Lithuania, uh, Senpo Su uh, Chiunis Sugihara. Uh, he issued Japanese uh, passports uh, to uh, Japanese transit visas to Jews to get to Curaçao, the island of Curaçao, off uh, the coast of Venezuela. That was the final destination. No one came to Curaçao, but they all managed to get out of Lithuania in time. So 
uh, many lives were saved because the Germans kept them, uh, kept them in, in separate confinement and didn't send them immediately to Auschwitz. Uh, and But no one came to Paraguay. But when Paraguay learned that its honorary consul in Switzerland had issued these passports uh, on false premises, because these were illegal passports. The people who got these Paraguayan passports were actually Polish citizens, not Paraguayan. So they dismissed the uh, honorary consul, Mr. Rudolf Hugli. They, they fired him uh, in Switzerland. And uh, but and then the story was over. But but no one actually came. I'm not saying no one came to Paraguay, but not on these passports. Okay, question for Heidi Fishman. So we didn't really speak at all about your book. You wrote this fabulous book about your mother's story called Tutti's Promise. And what I particularly love about the book is not only the book itself, but you have a whole website with educational materials. We do have a lot of teachers in our audience. Can you tell a little bit more about your book and the whole educational curriculum you have around it? So my intention with the book was to, um, I, I like to say it teaches like a textbook, but it reads like a novel. I did uh, I, I did make up all the dialogue, so it has to be called fiction, but all the events in the book are true. Um, these are things that actually happened, and I put a lot of the the documentation that I found in the book. I wrote it with middle school in mind. Um, high schools are using it as well. And what I'm trying to do is introduce students to the Holocaust and in a way that is developmentally uh, available for the for middle school kids. I, a lot of children either read night, which I feel is way too intense for a middle school audience. It's, it's too harsh. They don't get it because they have to tune out. Or they read Diary of Anne Frank, which is, again, also a wonderful book, but not really about the Holocaust. It takes place during the Holocaust. So I was trying to explain what happened in Western Europe and how it, how it happened in a, in a quote unquote gentle way, as much as you can be gentle about such a topic. And then in my, on my website, there's all kinds of discussion questions and extra material to go along with the book. Okay, question for Alexandra. Since this was a partnership between Jewish rescuers and non-Jewish rescuers, someone wants to know which one was your family? Were you a, is it a Jewish family or non-Jewish family? So very interesting. My grandfather, Stefan, was born Catholic. He was a Polish Catholic. And it's interesting that the Waters Group had three, I think, three Jews and three non-Jews. But my, my father, Tomas Rinievich, married a Jewish woman. So that's how the family's made up. But my grandfather was not Jewish. But according to the Jewish law, I'm Jewish because my mother's Jewish who married a Catholic man. So gets a little confusing, but those are the facts. Okay. Thank you for the question. Now there's a question, I think, for Dr. Paldiel about the group Zygota. So it, can you explain what that is and if there's any connection with this story? Okay, I was going to speak in the conclusion about Zygota. Zygota is the code word of an organization that was created in Warsaw in 1942 by the Polish underground for the purpose of helping Jews uh, on the run, helping them with finding uh, sheltering places, uh, uh, new documentation, change their IDs, uh, if they needed medical assistance, and children, Jewish children, to find. Uh, a uh, refuge for Jewish children, basically in the religious institutions and in the Catholic institutions and nunneries and so forth. So the code word of that organization, the, the full title was Council for the Rescue of Jews, but the code word that they used was Zygoda. They operated in Poland uh, from the Polish underground. The money, the finances came from overseas, from Jewish and non-Jewish organizations. There was no contact whatsoever between Zygoda, who started operation in the fall of 1942, and what was taking place in Switzerland at about the same time by Alexander Ladosh uh, in the Polish uh, embassy. At that time, it was uh, a legation uh, in Bern, Switzerland. They, they had no contact. 
uh, maybe they have, they heard of each other through underground channels, but two separate operations, but with good results. According to Jagoda statistics, thousands of Jews were helped, were saved. Uh, the other thing that is common to them, uh, they were both Jewish participants, both in the, uh, uh, in the Polish uh, passport scheme, okay, uh, as Alexandra mentioned, and in Jagoda, there were also two Jewish persons, two important Jewish leaders of pre-war Poland. One was Zionist and the other one was not Zionist, and they were also members of Jagoda. So we have two separate operations, okay. uh, thousands of miles apart, uh, in which uh, thousands of Jews were saved, and in which uh, Jews participated together with non-Jewish persons in, this, in these uh, rescue operations. Now, there are several questions that have to do with a little bit of confusion about who was saved, who was not saved. Did the passports really work? Uh, I think that it needs to be emphasized that any scheme is not going to be 100% successful. I personally actually have family members that are on this Wadish list as having received Paraguayan passports. I've looked at the list. The list, I think, is available online. Maybe uh, if somebody can post the link, people can look for their own family names. But I know that those family members of mine did not survive. Heidi, that Paraguayan passport of your family, it was of no good at first, and then it was recognized. So it was kind of hit or miss. Is that correct? Uh, okay, go ahead, Heidi. I would say yes. I mean, they, they know of about 3,000 names that were on these passports. They're estimating there's between eight and 10,000 people that probably had the passports because they haven't, they're looking at those numbers that were in the corner to figure out how many passports were actually issued. And the estimate for how many were saved, I think is somewhere around 700. Mordecai, you might know that number offhand. Yes, it's like seven or 800. But I want to add something to what Heidi said. Now, the Germans were not fooled. Uh, they knew that these Polish Jews uh, who uh, had never heard of the country Paraguay were not really Paraguayan citizens. When, uh, so, but uh, the Germans, uh, it was politics. They, want, they didn't want Paraguay to be on the side of the allies. And they wanted the Germans, you know, and there's a big German community in Paraguay. They wanted these Germans back home in Germany to help them in the war effort. So what happened that uh, one day the, uh, I mean, these Jewish persons were still under German control, but they were kept in separate places. One place was uh, in, uh, in France called Vitel, which is actually a resort area. But then when the Germans were totally convinced that these passports were fake passports and these people were not really Paraguayan citizens, then all these people were in danger of being sent to concentration camp. And so here again, the Polish legation in Bern and Ladosh, uh, they got involved with the Polish government in exile with the Red Cross to try to save these people. And they actually put uh, pressure on the US government and the US government put pressure on Paraguay to honor, to say, we will honor these passports. Although they only learned about this the, when, when the Germans questioned the validity of these passports. In the meantime, some of these people were already taken to Auschwitz and they were murdered there. Okay, that's number one. Number two, many of these uh, passports were issued to Jewish persons in the Warsaw Ghetto or in other places in Poland via special couriers, underground couriers. Now, when these passports arrived at the addresses, uh, the Jewish person were no longer there. They had already been killed. So the Germans picked up these passports and they sold it to other Jews to come up from their hiding places saying, you want to go to Paraguay? Here, yeah, we can afford it. Just leave your hiding place wherever you are. And a lot of Jews fell into that trap. And uh, they were at the beginning, they were, they were taken to a hotel in uh, Warsaw called Hotel Polski. And they were very well treated. And when the Germans had enough, several thousand Jews who uh, naively got out of their hiding places on the mistaken belief that they would now take the place of those people who appeared on, the, on these passports, 
uh, that they would go uh, to Latin America. And so they were taken to Auschwitz, first of all to Bergen, Belgium, then to Auschwitz. So it's a mixed story about how many of these thousands and thousands of passports, how many of the people survived. Some people, uh, uh, the, the passports didn't reach them because they were already in hiding and they stayed in hiding. They only learned after the war that there was a passport which was addressed to them, but they were in hiding and survived. And so they didn't need the passport. So it's still a mixed bag and the research, it needs more research. But as was mentioned by Heidi, at least uh, 800 of these passport people did of the thousands, at least 800. In fact, if you want to add their children too, uh, did survive the Holocaust and the war. Now, Mordechai, you mentioned that all these people are deserving of honors. And there's a question about Yad Vashem, and I know it's a delicate question, but it's being asked. So tell us about Yad Vashem's position on this group. Okay, so here, with all due respect to Yad Vashem, I worked for 24 years at Yad Vashem. I was head of the Department of the Righteous Among the Nations. Uh, I didn't know about this story. I had no idea. I never heard about this story. I knew about Jigoda, but not about that particular story of the of the fake passport. Uh, so when I learned that Yad Vashem had honored one of the Polish diplomats, Konstanty Rukitsky, who was simply carrying out orders from his superiors. And who were his superiors? Stefan Rydievich and Alexander Lados. And there's a vast documentation to support that, vast. I did a whole research uh, and I wrote to Yad Vashem and I said, gentlemen, you made a mistake. Uh, you should have honored these other two persons too. Now, uh, so far, I have not received a positive response. The response that I received, the typical bureaucratic response, oh, we studied all the documents and we came to the conclusions uh, that we came. I asked him, why did you deny the honors to the other two persons? I just want to have an answer. Why was it denied? And the answer was, we studied all the documents and we came to the conclusions that we arrived at. And so uh, the fight is not yet over. And hopefully uh, the skies, the clouds will clear over Yad Vashem. You know, organizations are very stubborn when they are caught making a mistake. Uh, and they cannot uh, correct, but eventually uh, I hope uh, that good sense will prevail and Alexander Ladosh and Stefan Winievich will receive the full honors as was given to Konstanty Rokitsky. Amen to that. And before I give the word to our speakers for their final thoughts, I want to take this opportunity to make a little pitch for the foundation and urge you to support us. I know that when we have paid programs, you buy tickets, which is really wonderful, but our, our expenses outrun um, what our income is from these paid programs. So if you have a little bit extra, um, it's tax deductible and we are so grateful for any donation. And we love bringing you inspirational, beautiful stories like this one. So now let's turn back to our speakers for their final thoughts. And Alexandra, I haven't thrown many questions your way and I apologize, but what would you like to say to our audience in closing? Well, in closing, I would like to thank each of you for taking time out of your day to join us today. It's really amazing to see all these faces on the screen. And again, I just, I, I really struggle for the words to adequately express how I feel about this. It's just, it's so, Unbelievable. I think I read someone say in the chat, not even the greatest, you know, screenwriter could make this up, you know, and it's it's true. It's it's a true story. And it's it's a story of hope. It's a story of courage. And it's a story about doing the right thing and about being a hero. So what I want to leave you all with is this: these men were brave men who risked everything and had absolutely nothing to gain. They gained nothing financial, financially or monetarily from this. They did this in the name of humanity to help other people. And I just want you to think about what kind of imprint that you can leave on others because you don't have to be of a certain stature or have a title or 
you know, it doesn't matter what walk of life you come from, anybody can be a hero, young or old, big or small, whatever nationality or religion you practice, it doesn't matter. We can all be someone's hero. So I just want you to think about how you can be a hero to someone, because if these brave men had not risked everything to do this, there wouldn't be families together today. There wouldn't be legacies. When I think about my grandfather kept this secret from my family. My family knew nothing about it. Had he said anything about this, he may have been killed and my father wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be here. And same with Heidi and same with Mordecai. I mean, it's just unbelievable to think that we are alive and well and here with you today because of these efforts, these brave efforts of these men. So think about what you can do to help others, whether it's the smallest gesture, you could be someone's hero. That's Thanks, such a great message. Heidi, what would you like to say? Um, it's hard to say anything after that. Um, I will add, um, Alex said something about they didn't uh, get any monetary, uh, they, didn't, they didn't get paid for doing this. They also didn't get recognition. They were, they were not bragging about what they did. It was just quiet. We just do this because it's the right thing to do. It was about morality, it was about humanity, and it was, they didn't care about societal labels or the politics. This was do the right thing, save lives. Um, and it was also just, what's unbelievable here is that this is just coming to light now. There are still stories out there. You know, people think we know everything that happened during the Holocaust. Well, we don't, there are still stories out there. Um, and I'm, I'm just gonna do a quick, that's the book. People are asking what the book is, where to find it. Here it is, Tootie's Promise, and it's on Amazon. So uh, there's just so many questions in the chat. Yes, Mordecai. buy it, buy it. Mordecai, the floor is yours. Okay, so I only learned about uh, Linievich two years ago when uh, Jakob Kumos, the ambassador, the Polish ambassador in Switzerland, sent me these documents. You see, when we arrived in Switzerland, we arrived as Polish citizens. My father had a Polish passport. Uh, we, came, we arrived from Belgium, but uh, originally my father came from Poland, so he still had a Polish passport. So when we went into Switzerland, then of course the Swiss said, okay, you can stay, but somebody has to pay for your upkeep. And since you are Polish citizens, they, they addressed it to Poland and, uh, and the Polish uh, paid for our upkeep while we were interned in these camps. Uh, so I, that, that factor I knew already, but I didn't know that there was a man called Stefan Rinievich who was personally involved in the trying to get uh, the family, my family to be united together, to be out of these three different places and they could be together in one place as a family unit. So I got these documents uh, only uh, two years ago and uh, I felt very happy. I also felt very sad uh, and I'm still a little bit sad. I wanted to meet the Stefan Vinievich uh, and I wanted to say to him, I wanted to shake his hand and say, thank you. Thanks to you, we were able to be a family in Geneva for a full year. Uh, you didn't have to do it, but you did it. And you wrote these letters saying, we will support the family, don't worry. They're not gonna be a public charge. So, uh, and this is something we have to do. We have to at least say thank you, acknowledge goodness. And so, uh, but I'm very happy that I'm meeting her granddaughter, Alexandra Ryder. So I be, I'm able to say to Alexandra, to you, thank you for your grandfather. Thank you very much. And uh, perhaps he's listening to us from upstairs now and uh, receiving these acknowledgements. For me, this is very important to, to be able to say thank you. I don't know where your grandfather died. If he's in Buenos Aires, he died in Buenos Aires. He did. And uh, if I ever get there to Buenos Aires, I want to go to his tombstone and place both a flower and in the Jewish tradition, place a stone and stand there and reflect 
And maybe I want to also say Kaddish, the Jewish prayer in commemoration of the dead. This is a, an obligation I feel I'm going to have to do one day to be able to say thank you to your grandfather. And a final remark is here we have a group of Polish diplomats and Jewish persons. Now, these three Jewish persons come from different ideological stands. One was a Zionist, the other was an anti-Zionist, one was secular, and the other one was religious, but they all banded together, these Jews and these Poles, uh, in the cause of humanity to save lives. And so I think we can use that example as a role model uh, for Jews and non-Jews, Jews, non-Jews, non Poles or whoever, in order to get involved whenever there is a challenge and uh, a humanitarian challenge. And we can work together in spite of our differences, uh, as was done in both the case of uh, these Polish diplomats in Switzerland and as was mentioned, Shigoda. So these things are not only for this program, they have to be retold and retold to other audiences to show them that we can work together in spite of our differences whenever there is a need uh, to do something, uh, a humanitarian cause. Uh, hopefully this will happen. Thank you. Good, so we've run over a little bit, but I don't think anybody minded because I think everyone was on the edge of their seat. This is an amazing story. And what's more amazing is this just now coming to light, really the, just the past few years. And so we'll know more and more. And I do sincerely hope that Yad Vashem will do the right thing, honor the two other non-Jewish rescuers. I hope B'nai B'rith, which honors Jewish rescuers, will honor all of the Jews in the group, including Julius Kuhl, who's, who's, I think, whose idea it was. I think he was the instigator. And so all these people deserve our, our thanks and our thanks to, to our audience, our thanks to our speaker speakers, and um, see you all soon. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.